Hi, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, is Ken. How are you doing, Ken? I'm well, thank you for asking, Rory. I'm delighted to be here. And both Rory and I are delighted that you've joined us for episode 229 of the Counseling Tutor Pop- Podcast. <laughs> Popcast. I don't know what I'm thinking there, <laughs> Rory. Pop stars we are. <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> so in what can you expect in episode 229? Well, we start off with those counseling foundations where we revisit the basic theories and principles that underpin counseling. And today, a theory from the person centered approach and we're looking at the seven stages of process moving on to focus on self where we recognize you are the heartbeat of your practice and we need to look after ourselves and take care of ourselves in order to be there for the clients that we see and today we're going to be looking at the difference between reflective and reflexive and how we can use that uh, within our growth and within our practice and then we go on to practice matters where today we have an interview with an expert it is a good a a, a favorite of counseling tutor and a really good friend of counseling tutor it's amy launder speaking about working with survivors of narcissistic abuse rory reached out an amazing interview so make sure you stick around for that but starting off with the uh the foundations we always put the foundations in first rory so that we can build upon it and today we're looking at the seven stages of process yes it was the final it was the final part of roger's big theory and it started really in 1951 when carl rogers um produced the 19 propositions which were published in client centered therapy then we moved through to 1957 where rogers talked about the six necessary and sufficient conditions for therapeutic change and then on his book on becoming a person in 1961 he talked about the seven stages of process and through that arc of 10 years what rogers did was he built a foundation of personality in the 19 propositions he then went to develop a way of engaging with clients and building the therapeutic relationship in the necessary and sufficient therapeutic conditions and then finally he brought brought us the seven stages of process and here's the bombshell ken it's a form of measurement it's a phenomenological form of measurement because Rogers talked about about um, growth and osmosis and in my understanding of osmosis is it is how plants grow and it is a way of measurement there's seven stages of process you can use it very briefly and very and very kind of lightly to chart the growth of a client through the arc of therapy and that is why Rogers theory is so elegant it's phenomenologically based, but it's based in real science. People forget Rogers was a hard-nosed psychologist. Mm. He was a he was a numbers guy. He was he was a researcher, and he built this little ecosystem of ideas that gave us a client-centered therapy. Mm, I love this. I and mean, you you said a bombshell, Rory, and that was like a going off as you were saying that because often on our Facebook group and, and in emails that we receive, uh, we get questions about, can you really do assessment if you're working in a purely client-centered way, because surely the client is leading the way. And here we see Rogers has built assessment into the model. It's there, we are assessing where is this person at? We have a scale. And you were speaking about Rogers being a scientist, a hard-nosed scientist, which of course he was, and science is about measurements. You know, often I think that uh, the, 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 the person-centered approach is, is is spoken about as as woolly and fluffy but when you really dig into it and go deep into the theories everything you need is there and i love the state that the the, uh the, the seven stages of process also known as the journey from fixidity to fluidity and you were speaking about osmosis rory osmosis if i i'm going back to my days in South Africa to the classroom where I was studying biology. (laughs) Uh, It was called Standard 9, I think we did cell biology. And osmosis is the process of something moving from a high pressure to a low pressure or something going through the walls of a cell. So water going through the wall of the cell, moving from one place to another place. And that's exactly what we're seeing with our clients, where they may come in going, 
in in maybe uh, one of the early stages where they will be going, well, it's everybody else has got a problem. If every, if the world could change, my life would be better. If you had a job like mine, you would also be experiencing my problems. If you'd lived a life like mine, you would. So everything's about the past. It's fixed and I'm stuck to a place of fluidity. And that's where we're aiming to go in person-centered therapy, where the person is more accepting of the feelings in the here and now and accepting the journey as something they have been on, not something that they're anchors them and holds them back yeah i like that ken i like that a lot and you're absolutely right you know the seven stages of process charts a journey from being very fixed in the world it's everybody else and they have to change and not me to the idea that the world is a fluid place and the changes we have to change to adapt to the world and, you know, the more I read Rogers, the, <clears throat> the more I appreciate just what a genius he was, because that links in to the 19 propositions. It links into the fact the world is changing around us and we adapt to that changing world. And it's those who don't adapt that have the biggest difficulties. And I like to call the, the those three theories, the 19 propositions, the six necessary and sufficient conditions and the seven stages of the process, the trinity because those are the table legs that hold a tabletop on of person-centered therapy. Without, if you take one of those legs away, the whole, the whole thing collapses. Yep. <laughs> and it's true. And, you know, we talked for ooh, a good few years, Ken, and part of our uh, assessment board's um, criteria for the final portfolios, final exam, if you like, was people had to use the theory to chart a person's progress and they had to they had to speak about what the, where the client was and how that fitted in so it is a very it's a very elegant and i think possibly it's a very uh, subjective view of measurement because it's based on the therapist looking and saying well this is what you know this is you need know, the client saying this this is how they've changed so it's not a it's not a kind of quantitative measurement it's a qualitative measurement yeah. so those of you who are doing research qualitative <laughs> quantitative is numbers qualitative is observation i can i can see uh i can see the pencil scribbling down rory this is this is important stuff these it are is. extra marks specifically in something like a case study mm. in a case study you know when that client came in where were they at where where did they i mean this is of course if you if you are uh working from a person-centered approach and, and your awarding body is 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 uh setting criteria according to the theory of person-centered but where was that person where they came in was there any change did, did they maybe move from one mm -hmm stage to a different stage during that process that is part of 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 uh, the journey that that gets you the extra marks and you're referring uh well to the theory there now i've, I've got an interesting one for you rory right okay you know roger speaks about uh his potato experiment i love the potato experiment. Yes. so for those of you who, who don't know the potato experiment rogers took some potatoes uh, put them in a in, in an environment where they were maybe uh, a little starved of, of of light and that that they would need but yet still those potatoes grow the organism strived to be what it what it was meant to be and you know when we're speaking about therapy we're speaking about counseling we often think that that takes place within a special room or online where you have a therapist and a person but i i put it to you rory Here, here's my sneaky theory now that the seven stages of process is part of the organism's development as we go through life and i'll tell you where i'm basing this if you if you speak to people that are in their senior years they seem to have a a softer approach on life a more accepting approach not everyone but it tends to be that as we go through life and we live life our organism tends towards that more open more accepting mindset not in everyone but it's kind of just a, a bit of a ken theory being put forward there don't put this in your assignments by the way <laughs> don't put this in your side this is just me musing yeah i mean i i i think i think you're right it's it speaks it speaks to you know a, a, a development of life but it also speaks, I think, to client motivation. One of the one of the things that never fails to amaze me, Ken, is how Roger's work is right. And you know, recently, well, you know, recently, John Norcross at Scranton University 
looked at what we call common factors. And we've done it. We've done a podcast on common factors. Um, and interestingly, one of the things that comes out is motivation, client motivation to change. And this is exactly what the seven stages of process is about. If someone's motivated to change. You know, you can give them, you know, as using the potato analogy, all the water and all the food, mm. but there needs to be some kind of movement from the from the potato. The potato needs to be alive enough to be able to absorb it and to be able to grow and develop. And, um, you know, Rogers, when he was at Wisconsin, he, 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 he did his psych project where he worked with people with psychosis. And, and his, his research showed that people with psychosis were as likely to get a benefit from therapy as were the general population who didn't have psychosis, but motivation was the key. Mm. So it does speak to how motivated people are, which brings me, and I've got a puzzler for you, Ken. Are you ready for this? Yeah, go, go, go. Tony Merry in Learning and Being, which is, I think is a really, really good foundation book if you're, if you're a student of counselling and psychotherapy, says if somebody's in stage one of the seven stages of process, is it actually ethical to counsel them? Mm. Oh, Be- like because they are saying, well, I don't need to change. Everybody else does. Yeah. So <clears throat> we, we got a super duper hang- handout. So I'm referencing that now. So I just wanted to give you the, 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 the background for this in the super duper handout that Rory created. It, it refers to stage one as the individual in this stage of fixidity and remoteness of experience is not likely to come voluntarily for therapy. And, and, you know, what does that mean? Well, it basically means if somebody is in stage one, the, 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 the issue doesn't sit with them. It's everybody else. It's their life. It's their boss. It's their partner. It's their kids. It's their, everything is externalized. So why should I go for therapy? They should all be going for therapy so that they can fix themselves so that life can be okay. So it's unlikely that a person in stage one would present for therapy. However, somebody might present in in stage one to their GP and the GP might suggest, oh, maybe counseling would be a place for you to go. And they might dip the toe in with crossed arms and a kind of (laughs) remoteness. And I I guess the question is, is it ethical to continue to work with them if if the problems are all around them and not situated in self, Rory? Yeah, I think it's an interesting discussion to have with peers in in the in the classroom. And and one of the things that I would note and one of the things that Ken and myself taught was one of one of the ways that you can assess where someone is is if they use they or I. So mm-hmm. if you're talking to someone and they're saying, well, they're saying this and they're saying, but if you're saying I am experiencing, I am feeling, then there's a, a there's, there's there's a sense there of some kind of self-awareness that there's some responsibility being taken. Now that's a broad statement. You know, people may have self-awareness and still use the they. But I, I think that once people start to interject and say, I am having difficulty with people, um, at that point, they're on a process of self-exploration and self-journey. And this is what the propositions are about. And I think what's really interesting is that, you know, you talked about stage one of the 19 propositions where clients are unlikely to present. But if we go right to the other side of the prop- of the seven stages of the process, in stage seven, you're not likely to see a client in stage seven because, because effectively they're engaging with the world as it is. And indeed in stage six, possibly they're taking the, the learning from therapy and they are journeying and engaging with the world and, and thinking about their own processes. It's a fascinating mm. phenomenological uh, set of measurements. And, you know, I'm going to say, Ken, I think it's sometimes forgotten. I think there's a lot of focus put on 19 propositions, a huge amount on the necessary and sufficient conditions. But the seven stages of process is one of those table legs. It's just as important. And I think once people understand it and engage with it, it the therapy makes so much sense. And the service to the client, I think, improves. Bingo. And that's that's the main reason we have these conversations you know if you're a student you'll be looking at the seven stages of process if you're studying the person-centered approach but maybe if you've qualified maybe the last time you looked at those seven stages of process was during your studies Mm. well then 
maybe a positive challenge in your direction is do yourself a favor and go and get the super duper handout that Rory's created because it goes through the seven stages of process, outlines what they are, but it also outlines where a client may be within those processes, how they might present. So it kind of gives us a clue. It gives us a heads up to where they may be. And just revisiting that, uh, um, that theory, as you say, Rory, is done in service of our clients and it is elegant and it does. I mean, if you've ever sat on a three legged stool with only two legs, you'll know it's hard work <laughs> because you're trying to balance the, the whole time. You're doing a lot of work. You need that third leg for it to be balanced and for it to have its elegance. It is part of the, the theory is a theory in its entirety. And I think you're right, Rory, you know, so much emphasis is put on what is sometimes referred to as the, the core conditions, just three oh. of the six conditions. Oh, oh don't count, I'm feeling I know, I know, we've spoken about this in other, <laughs> in other podcasts, but it, it, it is the, 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 the necessary and sufficient conditions are wrapped by the rest of the theory. They make sense in the rest of the theory. So if you want to get Rory's super duper handout, how do you do that? Well, it's free. Uh, you just go to counselingtutor.com. That's our mother website. Make sure you visit that. And in the very top menu bar, you will see there is a podcasts tab. Click on the podcast tab, make your way to episode 229 right there on the page. You'll find all the show notes for today, including any links to ex extra resources, and you'll be able to download Rory's super duper handout of the seven stages of process from that page. There's those foundations, Rory. Onto those foundations today, we're going to build uh, a bit of a focus on self and look at two words, reflective, reflexive. Yes, and it's interesting. This word has, has really come into the vocabulary of counselling, I think, only in the last few years, and certainly into things like assignments and teaching. And it's a word that comes up, you know, occasionally in our Facebook group. And if you're a member of our, if not a member of our Facebook group, go to Facebook, type in counselling tutor. Uh, we're a closed group, knock on the door and our kind, wonderful moderation team will let you in and you can see uh, meet hundreds of like-minded people talking about topics in the world of counselling, psychotherapy, students, there's qualified colleagues, we've got tutors, we've got some supervisors and it's a, it's a debate and people talk about things and reflexivity comes up and and i think that you know when i did my studies there was a lot of focus on reflection we need to be reflective in other words we need to sit and think and ponder and think about what we're doing but actually that's fine but actually at some point we need to say right i'm going to change things <laughs> and this is what i'm going to do and that is of course being reflexive so reflection is thinking about you know what's going on and, and, and what you might do reflexive is actually doing the things that you might change. And it's coming up a lot in assignments. And I don't know about you, Ken, but I found myself in supervision well, as a supervisor, you know, saying to supervisees, okay, we've, you've had to think about what's happened. What are you going to do about it? I am a bit of a direct supervisor. I have to say, so what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and that is the point where you're asking someone to be reflexive. Yeah, and, and I think it it spans certainly our, our formal core studies to become counsellors. As you said, Rory, you're going to certainly see this in, in, in assignment language and in criteria language. Um, I think it comes down to personal development as well. Mm. This is where I find myself at the moment. There we go. I've been reflective. This is where I find myself at the moment. But what am I going to do? And even if the I'm not going to do anything, I'm going to let myself be in this. That is being reflexive. You've decided at least something, a course of action um, with our casework, what's going on in our casework and how we prevent present that in supervision. And as you said, Rory, as supervisors looking, if you've got a supervisee coming in and they're bringing this is where I'm at, putting in that uh, reflexivity of, okay, what now? What are we going to do? What is the action plan or what are the steps that are going to be taken to have some form of, of, of movement there? So it is, I think I, I like the word, you know, and, and I'll be honest, Rory, when I studied that raw, that the, the, the word uh, reflective was definitely there. Very, very reflective. I heard it again and again and again, but reflexive seems to have been, uh, well, for me, certainly from my frame of reference, is a word mm. that I only learned within the last maybe eight, nine years. Yeah, absolutely, Ken. It's it's really, really interesting. And um, and what I what I did notice, I first came across it 
in um, you know higher education training, people who are doing degrees and masters, the word reflexivity came came mm. a, a lot. And I think I think there's there's a batch of new writers who are writing um, certainly in things like supervision, and they're talking about you know supervision being an active um, an active activity, not just uh, sitting having a having a, a, a cup of tea and a chat but actually helping a supervisee think what they're going to do because, you know, we, we can't as, as practitioners bury our heads in the sand. We have some, there are some cases where we have to do things and I'm not going to talk for everybody. I'm sure there's a lot of reflexive practitioners out there, but I do think that it was something that wasn't really drilled into me in training. And I think it, it speaks to the facts that our profession is now professional profession we're not an emerging profession when i as when i started we, we are we are a professional um organization as a, as a group of members and sometimes we have to take action and i think that speaks to being accountable and you know i, I welcome it to be honest ken because i think that you know we work with some very difficult situations and sometimes we have to make a decision we have to take action mm. yeah uh, definitely, I, I, I'm glad that the word is now encouraged and is and is part of being a uh, a, a counselor, really. Um, and I, I think about CPD, Rory, and how when you look now, with here, certainly here in the UK, one would evidence one CPD. You, you don't just do CPD and go, "There you go, I've done that." You're going to evidence it. You're going to write down what CPD you've done. Um, and when you look to some of the the uh, ethical bodies here in the UK, they will require that you state what CPD you did, and then they're going they're going to ask you about your re your reflection and your reflexivity around that. So after that CPD, you might reflect on that and have a think about that. But then, how does that apply to your practice? Or not apply to your practice. So reflexivity doesn't mean always having to take action. We can be reflexive and then not take action because that's the decision that has been made. But it is the process of deciding, is action required here? How is that action gonna, gonna play out? So you may go and do some CPD, you may sit and think about that CPD, and then you may think, I am going to implement this into my practice like such. And there you have shown yourself to be reflexive. Reflective, because you need to reflect in order to be reflexive. So it kind of evidences that the CPD is actually doing something uh, rather than just being a process of, uh, I guess, a simulation where it just washes over us. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Ken. And I think a, a good supervisor, you know, would pick up on a supervisee's areas of development and you know maybe send i send my supervisees information but i always follow up and say i will be asking you next time we meet i put it in my notes next time we meet what what have you done about it mm. and they know that when we meet at some point i'm going to say i sent you that information tell me what tell me what you've learned tell me how you might apply it and it speaks to the formative area in supervision, normative, formative, and restorative. Formative is an educational element. And supervisors should always be encouraging CPD, should be encouraging um, curiosity in their supervisees. And, and I think as a, a counsellor, you need to be a curious person about your profession. You need to think, oh, I don't know, don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. It's just a case of get, getting downloading a book or going onto the internet. But it's ongoing curiosity. That's my that's my phrase du jour, Ken. Ongoing curiosity should be our clarion call, I think, in terms of this podcast anyway. I like it. And, and you've mentioned supervision. I think it's right for me to mention if you uh, are at that point in your counselling career where you're considering training as a supervisor. Well, counselling tutor, Rory and myself and our team of tutors, we do offer uh, supervision training. Uh, and if you're interested in that, go to counsellingtutor.com. Uh, right there on the home page everything is available all the information is available for when our intake dates are for that and and i guess in, in closing that off rory i wonder after listening to this podcast today about reflective and reflexivity <laughs> what you might reflect on 
and what you might do differently. And I'm linking this to, to a thought, Rory. We, we run a counseling tutor, we run a, a, a CPD library for qualified practitioners, full of lectures and resources. And when you finish doing the CPD, you can claim a certificate. And it says, mm. it says here's the thing, it says 1.5 hours of CPD. And the lecture may only have been an hour long. So where does the extra half an hour come from? If it's 1.5 hours of CPD and it's only a 50 minute lecture, how does that work? And of course that works, that there is a process we should go through in reading the material that goes along with that. And then we're going to reflect on it, what we've learned, what that meant to us. And then there should be a reflexive process. How can that apply to me in my practice because of of course cpd is done in benefit of our clients and if it is done as either a, a way to tick a box to say to our awarding body yeah yeah we've done those hours or as a way to go say oh i've got another certificate i can put in my file now let me move on to the next cpd lecture then we're not doing right by ourselves and we're not doing right by uh, our clients by being reflective and reflexive, it makes a difference. It makes the CPD, the learning we do, the thoughts we have into actions that actually make a difference at client level. Bravo, Ken. I want to give you a round of applause for that. Oh, thanks, Rory. <laughs> because because it, it's the living, breathing, you know, it's the living part of our, of our practices, the fact that we are engaging in material, developing our knowledge, and, and we're not kind of just, you know, like a pittle in a jar on a shelf, just pittled. You know, we we are developing ourselves. And I, I think, I mean, I, I will I will say this, you know, there's never been a better time to do CPD. There is so much more information. When I started 20 years ago, there was a few books which were massively expensive. Uh, the internet it was around, but it wasn't that sophisticated. Um, nowadays, the information is changing and it's changing rapidly. Yep. You know, something you could know today um, might change. And in, in fact, in fact, um, I had a colleague many years ago who did a course on post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, did the course. When she'd finished it, she came back and discovered that actually what she'd learned was out of date. The very minute her certificate landed <laughs> through a letterbox, it was out of date and she had to do another course because they'd found more information and different ways of working. So, you know, even if you've got piles of certificates, doesn't mean that information is still valid. Ours is a fluid changing profession and it's driven by client experience. It's, it's, it's driven by lived experience of our clients. And, you know, what they tell us may not fit the orthodoxy of the, of the theories that go around. New theories are developed, new, new learning is taken and we become more effective uh, in the service of our clients, Ken. Love it. Well, there you have. That is that focus on self, reflexive, reflective. How's that going to make a difference in your practice? And then we move on to practice matters, where we dip our two toe, or two toes maybe even, <laughs> into <laughs> the world of practice. And we look at what we might come across across and that might be a presentation it might be the day-to-day -day running of a practice and today rory you you met with a, a good friend and, and regular lecturer for our cpd library of counseling tutor amy launder uh, and spoke about the topic of working with survivors of narcissistic abuse yes i mean, I mean amy has, has spoken and, and done lectures on narcissism before but this particular lecture is working with survivors of narcissistic abuse Again, just linking into the last into the last section, a, a emerging um, presentation that people are now recognizing that this is happening to them. And she's delivered a fantastic lecture on this. And I asked her about some of the ways we work with survivors of narcissistic abuse. And this is what she told us. And we welcome back one of our favorite presenters. Our audience loves. Amy Londa, and who's done a fantastic lecture for the Counselor CPD Library on working with survivors of narcissistic abuse. So, so welcome back, Amy. It's good to see you. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me again. So, you you've done. We, we talked in in podcast two two four about 
um, what narcissism is and narcissistic personality disorder. And now we're looking at the other side of the coin, I guess, mm -hmm. where people may um, have um, suffered um, under the, the hands or the actions of someone who is, um, by all accounts, a narcissist. So what is the first thing we have to think about when we work with someone who's uh, survived narcissistic abuse? Well, I think one of the most important things is that they often don't realise that they have suffered from narcissistic abuse. What you'll often see is clients coming in, being really confused about how the relationship ended, why it ended, and what they did wrong. Because the whole relationship is designed almost to make them the bad guy. They're the cause of all the problems. So when the relationship ends, they're blaming themselves and looking at themselves rather than at what the other person has done. Yes, and, and when we when we talked about in uh, one of the things we talked about in episode two two four was was how narcissists may be initially attracted to someone who may be successful, and mm -hmm. then bl use the success and the fact that someone's got a successful successful career as a way of blaming that person for the relationship not working. Yes, definitely. So it's all it's often the things that initially attracted the narcissist to their victim that then becomes a source of contention. So it's, it maybe then makes the narcissist feel bad that they're not as successful, so then they try to tear the victim down. They also are constantly moving the goalposts. So if the, um, the narcissist wants the victim to have a successful career, once they've achieved that, then the narcissist might complain that they're not home enough. And, and you know, the, the goalposts are always moving and the narcissist is never satisfied. Yeah, so it sounds it sounds like the relationship is built on shifting sand, that mm. the people can't find the feet. And I'd like to pick up on something you said. You, you talked about sometimes people not realising that they are actually a survivor of narcissistic abuse, and 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 I think that's something that I've identified in my practice. I've certainly worked with clients who who believe that if they've just done a little better, if they just worked a little harder, if they could have just been a bit more. Mm. They, they, the, the relationship would have survived, and these small things that come up, where for me you could you could pick them up, and one of the things is um, gaslighting. Gaslighting mm. is a favourite kind of trick of someone who is, is is abusing someone in a narcissistic way, isn't it? Yes, definitely. And actually, when you look at where that term actually came from, you can then start to see gaslighting in all sorts of different ways. So it actually came from a play that was called Gaslight or Gaslit, which is all about a husband trying to drive his wife crazy in order to get away with the things that he was doing. Um, and it is all about the gas lights in the, in the apartment kept dimming because he was turning lights on elsewhere in the building and claiming that he wasn't. So that's where the term comes from. So any situation where you're being made to feel like you're crazy or you're too sensitive or anything like that when actually you're just responding to something that they're doing is a form of gaslighting. Yes, yeah, so I, I can remember many years ago someone telling me about um, a window in their house and the person came and said, have you opened that window? And, uh, and, and my client said, no, I've not opened it. And the, and, and the person who clearly had opened it, it was only two people in this place, mm. well, denied point blank to the yeah. point where the person said, well, it must have been me then. And you're yeah. absolutely right. This second guessing is mm. is very very difficult. I'm I'm wondering, is, is it can it be a revelation to some clients that actually this has gone on? Does it go under the radar until it's brought into the awareness? Yeah, definitely. I mean, even just the other day, a client described a whole um, almost year long friendship, not even a relationship, where all sorts of things were happening. And then I started talking to this client about the patterns of what a narcissist does and the things that they say. And it was just completely blew the client's mind that, that all of this had gone on and she, they hadn't realized what was going on. Um, you know, it was hiding passports and cutting out the internet and all sorts of things like that, that she just thought it was the, the person being strange, not that there was a name for it or that other people went through it and, and, yeah, I think it very often can be a massive re revelation and actually then being able to Google it afterwards, after you find out and see that you're not alone, I think can be quite helpful. 
Yes, because I, I too remember, I didn't see the play Gaslight, but mm. I remember watching the black and white TV program many, many, mm -hmm. many years ago. And one of the things <clears throat> that it stri strikes me about gaslighting is that other people find it hard to believe because the the abuser can be so plausible, mm. can be a very plausible person. Yeah, and actually what was so interesting recently on Netflix, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a docuseries called Bad Vegan. Nothing to do with her being a vegan, but it's this guy that comes into her life and he... I think over a series of a couple of years, she sent him $1.7 million because he kept saying, I'm endangering money. And it's like the Tinder swindler and all these people managing to get massive amounts of money out of their victims by being that plausible. But to the outside observer, it seems so implausible. Like, how could you fall for it? But when you're in the middle of it, it's really difficult to see clearly. Yes, and I suppose that's another aspect because I would imagine that some people would feel a little foolish mm -hmm. um, because everybody else could see what was going on. I, I can remember many years ago there was someone who convinced his flatmates he was he was a secret agent mm. and he, he had them hiding in the cellar of a disused house for years, yeah. uh, or a long time, mm. if my memory serves me. And it was only, and he actually, he actually fooled the police as well. The police actually believed he was, a, he arrested someone and produced a fake MI5 identity card. Wow. And yeah. um, and it, it was only after a few years that he actually got caught out. But he, he, he was very, very plausible. Mm. And, and yes, you're absolutely right. Clients, it may seem so real. And I guess that's the message, isn't it? It can seem so real. You might be thinking you're losing your mind. Yeah, definitely. And then there's the other side of it as well, where the victim themselves starts to realise that something is off. But because the narcissist is so charming to everyone else and different with the victim, everyone else doesn't see what's going on and doesn't maybe believe the victim when they do start coming out and saying that there's something wrong. Almost believing maybe that the victim is the one that's abusive or that's that is actually crazy or seeing things and making things up. Um, and something that a narcissist will do is when they can no longer control the way that the victim sees themselves, they'll try and control how everyone else sees the victim. So they'll start spreading rumors and lies and stories about how horrible the victim is. Yes. It's, 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 it's really, really interesting. And it, it happens more than you think many years ago. I, I had a call, I had a, I had someone I knew um, oh. who's, who's son, um, it was definitely displaying narcissistic traits. And he had a, a, a vegetarian a girlfriend who was a vegetarian and he made her eat meat. Wow. Yeah. And and I think that, that kind of really summed it up, you know, that, that kind of power imbalance. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, is there a, is there a gender issue here? So, you know, are, 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 are people who, who would present, as survivors of narcissistic abuse, mainly women, or is there men? Well, is it is it across the genders? It is across the genders. I was really careful in recording the lecture to try to be gender neutral, but it's <laughs> difficult because I think there is such the maybe a higher prevalence of people that come forward where the victim is female and the perpetrator yes. is male. But I think it definitely does. I mean, I've seen in my personal life, friends who are male who have been victims of female narcissists. So it definitely happens both ways, but I think maybe there's a higher prevalence of male narcissistic abusers and female victims. I think in, in females, it maybe comes across more in friendships and social media and stuff rather than in romantic relationships, perhaps. Yes, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And I, I suppose that in, in the age of social media and the fact we're all we're all very much more connected now. Mm -hmm. um, people are more accessible, and there's more there's more opportunity to 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 gaslight people on social media than ever before. Definitely, yeah, definitely. So, as we come to the end of, of of our time together, Amy, I wonder what what you would want people who view this lecture, our colleagues who view this lecture, to take away from it. I, I emphasize it a lot at the end of the, the lecture itself as well, but the importance of validation from the therapist um, to the client and, and the psychoeducation that what they went through was actually abuse and manipulation, but also how careful you need to be because often 
when friends do believe what has happened, they're very dismissive of anything other than that person is a bad person and leave it at that. Whereas actually the process of unpicking everything is so long that there needs to be a lot of patience, a lot of understanding of the kind of flipping back and forth between hating the abuser and actually still loving them. And yeah, the importance of patience and, and how long it can take to unpick everything. Yes, to, to get people people back to where they can make a, I, I guess, a kind of a relative appraisal of what the relationship was well yeah. it's always a joy speaking to you amy this lecture yeah. isn't to to be missed because i think there's more um kind of narcissistic abuse than we'd like to really think about um so as always amy thank you very much big thank you to amy launder and to you rory for reaching out and and hosting that interview really really interesting uh, and if you're interested in hearing more of uh, uh, Amy's work, uh, watching Amy lecture, her lectures are available in our uh, Counselor CPD library and you can get more information about that just by going to counsellingtutor.com. There's two L's in counselling. We're based in the UK. That's how it's spelt here. Counsellingtutor.com. Uh, have a look at the CPD library and that's where you can get that information. Rory, this has been episode 229 of the Counselling Tutor podcast. Yeah, so we started off with seven stages of process. The, the final piece of theory in Carl Rogers' trinity that, of course, is person-centred therapy. The osmotic change, the journey that a client goes through in the arc of therapy, such an important piece of theory. Then we move to focus on self. We talked about being reflexive and re or reflective and reflexive. Things that we things that we think about and things that we do, and the whole notion of accountability in the world of counselling and psychotherapy. And finally, we finish with Amy Launder, who gave us a wonderful interview on working with survivors of narcissistic abuse. And as always, stay grounded and stay safe.